Monday. So you get you guys get a two week reprieve. And so this will be your last advanced lecture until July eighth. So all right, so you guys get to go go on my ESCRS trip as always as is a tradition to Vienna. This is the ceiling of the cathedral. It's very spectacular. Uh, so basically, you go in and. Everybody walks in and goes, Whoa. <laughs> and that's immediately followed by 500 people going. <laughs> so the thought is, or good doing this. <laughs> Selfies. I was there. Okay. Well, I don't have a selfie stick, so sorry. I'm not in any of these. You notice there are never people in Dr. Mamelis's photos. <laughs> yeah, it's because I don't have a selfie stick. <laughs> I have a selfie stick. So, this is one of the um, medieval knights who's there. This is literally him sitting there in the cathedral. I don't imagine that there's still any kind of ophthalmic tissue in there that we can evaluate. But and then, this is the altar. I mean, up again, spectacular, spectacular painting, carvings, and altar. This is still a functioning church, and so they've got. Uh, choirs in there, concerts in there. This last time I was in Vienna, there was a full-blown concert going on when I was there. But I'm not going to put you guys through the video. It was a good concert. Spectacular. And then as you go in, it's got the side uh, passages once again going up to the ceiling. A lot of natural light in here in the shelves. And then this is the side passage. So pretty, pretty spectacular place. Okay, we're going to talk about the conjunctiva. So, Kayla. Conjunctiva. Tell me about the main areas of the conjunctiva. It's the bulbar, or the seal, and Okay, so bulbar means literally on the globe next to the bulb. And so the conjunctiva will actually blend at the limbus with the corneal epithelium. And then fornicial here, forming the fornix, and then palpebral being on the um, inside surface of the eyelid. So three basic parts to the conjunctiva. Now, let's go back a little bit to some of the pathology here. First of all, Vaish, tell me about the epithelium of the country. It's a stratified, squamous, non fragment Okay, well, I know this is low power, but these little white spots on here. The goblet cells. Goblet cells. And what do goblet cells make? Mucin. Mucin, all right. Catherine, why is mucin important? Um, it's part of the cell. Okay. So what are the three layers of the tear film? Um, it'll be um, mucin, equus, and lymphus. Okay. So the mucin layer is the innermost layer of the tear film. It's made by the goblet cells, and it makes the surface of the eye wettable, I guess is a better word. So if you look at the pathology on light microscopy of the surface of the cornea, it looks totally smooth. But if you look at electron microscopy, it's not. There's little microvilli sticking out all the time. And so if you just put water on there, on aqueous tears, would just kind of wash off and not spread out equally. And so when you line the um, inside of the tear film with mucin, it covers that, the jelly on the surface, and it allows the aqueous layer to smoothly coat the surface of the eye. And then finally, the lipid layer, the outside layer, um, which cells make that? Uh, the microbiome. The microbiome glands, right? So they keep it from evaporating. So if you'll notice right here, as you get closer to the limbus, there are no goblet cells. And so the further away you get from the limbus toward the fornix or toward the medial and lateral canthi, the more goblet cells you have. And so this is why if you have a disease, a cicatricial disease, a scarring disease, where the fornix gets shortened or it gets scarred off, you lose that production of the mucin and therefore people get severe dry eyes. So if you go ahead and, and they'll, they'll get some severe dry eyes. Okay, we're going to just talk about some different lesions or echo. What do you think this is? like a dermoid. All right, more specific. A dermoid. Okay, so this is even more specific. <laughs> um, this is hard because the term dermoid is, yeah. is confusing because you say dermoid. Is that oh, the cyst in the orbit? Is that this little growth of the limbus? So the technical term, it's, it's limbal dermal choristoma. 
So that's really what the term should be, and this will separate it from the dermoid cyst. What does chorostoma mean? Uh, it means a proliferation of tissue that's not at its normal site. Okay, as opposed to amartoma. Which is a proliferation of tissue that's at where it's normally found. Okay, good. And so chorostoma, it's benign proliferation. It's not a tumor, but it's tissue that normally doesn't belong there. And so if you look right here, you see this is a child, and you've got this fleshy white growth right here at the limbus. Um, okay, you've got it. All right, we're just going to keep moving down the line. What disease do we often see associated with limbal dermal chorostomas in children? Golden heart syndrome. And what are the other signs and symptoms of golden heart? Funny, kind of skinny teeth with, with uh, you know, spaces in between, even sometimes some skeletal anomalies. But the key is if you see a child with these, this limbal dermal chorostoma, you want to look in front of the ear for these little preauricular skin tags. So you can often see that with, with golden mars. All right, so the reason why these are called the chorostoma is there's tissue that's normally not there. We're just going to kind of keep going down the line there. So, what, what kind of tissue are we seeing here? Exactly, so you wouldn't expect to see those in the limbus, so there's connective tissue here. But you see, here's a hair follicle, and here's even a sebaceous gland with it. So you see a lot of connective tissue, that's why it's that white bump, but you'll see hair follicles, you'll see hair shafts, and then you can even see this kind of stuff. Tina, what is this? Two, two funny things. Here's one, here's another. Okay, what kind of glands do you think those could be? They sort of look like they're asinar okay. in, in shape, so I wouldn't call them a sebaceous gland. Yeah, they're sebaceous glands, do they have asinar shapes? No, so I wouldn't call them sebaceous. What, what um, glands do? They're working profusely in you right now. They're sweat glands. Sweat glands, well, and also lacrimal glands. And so these are little lacrimal glands, <laughs> and then there they are, the acinar shaped black ones. What is this stuff? That actually looks like bone. Not quite. Or, I'm um, sorry, cartilage tissue. Cartilage. And so no, that's what's yeah. interesting about these chorostomas. All kinds of tissue could show up there. And so you can see associated with this acinar glands, little almost like um, sweat glands or, or lacrimal glands, and then cartilage. So it's cartilage that's right here. And here's a close up of the cartilage. And so actual. Cartilage, so interesting. All right, bad picture here, but Chris, what are we looking at here? So we see this uh, kind of raised yellowish lesion uh, right there on the conj, exactly right there next to the lip. What do you think that could be? Uh, I mean, if this was taken in Utah, that could be a pimbuecula. Yeah, exactly. So we live in Utah, so. I mean, on, on my normal orders, I have when the technician just writes up any patient, it says pinguecula dry eyes. And so that's, every person in Utah has pinguecula and dry eyes because we have, it's elevation here, there's lots of UV exposure here, and of course it's very dry here. So pinguecula are just very common because we've got 300 days of sunshine, except when there's inversions. But Remember, even UV light penetrates the inversion. So wear your sunglasses even in an inversion when you're outside. And so this is a, a pinguecula. <coughs> what is this? Uh, it's a pterygium. Pterygium, and what's the difference? So the pterygium uh, crosses the limbus and grows onto the cornea. Exactly, so it's the same pathology. It's just pinguecula's over the conjunctiva, pterygium crosses and goes onto the cornea. Now when we look at the pathology, what is the pathology? You see a lot of um, so solar elastosis, so thinning of that kind of substantial appropriate down there, and then we see this basophilic degeneration, and oftentimes thinning of the epithelium as well. All right, so it's a disease of the subepithelial tissue, chronic UV exposure, and you get that little fraying, <coughs> kind of frayed elastic look to the collagen, the so-called solar elastosis, but then you can get kind of a smudgy blue basophilic degeneration of collagen. You can even get this stuff. What's that magenta colored stuff? 
Uh, so like some calcification. There. Calcium. So you can even get calcium in these. So when you look at pterygia at the slit lab, you can even get sometimes these little white flecks of calcium. And so you can sometimes get calcification with these. All right. Yeah. I don't know you. Uh, I'm Ian. I'm a medical student. Look, all right. Students get, you get um, immune from pimping. So <laughs> maybe though. I don't know if you're going to be here in two weeks. Maybe not. But okay. Let's see. All right. What is this? Upper lids inverted, you can see a cystic like structure. Alright, so you see this kind of a cystic structure, and how's a good way to tell in the clinic if it's really a cyst or if it's solid? You can transilluminate it. Exactly, so you take your fan off head and put it right next to there, and if it transilluminates, you know it's cystic. If it um, doesn't, it's solid. And so this looks pretty cystic to me. And so when we look at this, we want to look at the lining of a cyst. So we look at this lining. What do we see right here? So that's multiple layers of um, stratified squamous epithelium. And what are these? Those are called goblet cells. Yeah, so there's a stratified squamous <coughs> epithelium with goblet cells. So what kind of cyst do we call this? <coughs> exactly. So it's very similar to the lid. So for some reason, surface epithelium gets deposited underneath, and then it can just start growing, and it'll often form a circular cyst. Now these cysts can grow with time, they can even get filled with mucin. So they've got some mucinous material in them, so it's called an epithelial inclusion cyst. All right, so what are we looking at uh, down here? So this is an external photograph of what looks like to be maybe the left eye, and on the lower palpebral conjunctiva, we have kind of a follicular-like reaction. Okay, how do you tell the difference between follicles and papillae when you look with the slip lamp? So papillae tend to have a, like, traditionally like a central vascular core, whereas uh, the follicular conjunctivitis tends to have like that cobblestone type of... So it's got a cobblestone and the vessels tend to be around the periphery of these instead of in the center also. So what's the differential diagnosis if you're pulling the lower lid down and you see those follicles in there? Um, think of like viral okay. or allergic. So those are the two main ones, viral or allergic. And well, I don't know what's happening. I don't know about you guys' clinic, but I've seen three EKCs in the last two clinics. So, you know, viral conjunctivitis is all over the place. And by the way, it's called EKC. What does that stand for? EKC? Uh -huh. uh, I don't know. It, it stands for epidemic keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis because when you get these adenoviruses, it can spread not only through an entire household and family, but it can spread through a clinic. So the, when these were originally described more than 50 years ago, doctors' offices were spreading these around because they weren't cleaning the equipment, weren't cleaning their hands. And so people would come in, you'd do a tonometry, and then you wouldn't clean the tip, and then the next person would get the EKC. And so these can spread through a household, so you've got to warn these people wash your hands, your own face, you know, own face towel, your own washcloth, you know, don't, don't spread this around the house. And so viral, but also allergic look like this. And when we look at these follicles, you can see they've got this, um, just almost like a follicle elsewhere in the body. It's a lymphoid tissue. You've got the larger paler lymphocytes in the middle, the smaller <coughs> darker lymphocytes around it, and then the blood vessels go around the edges. So follicular conjunctivitis. Here's a close-up showing these large, larger, paler staining, uh, but still benign lymphocytes. All right, what are we looking at right here, Marshall? Um, so, <clears throat> this you can see like the central, or the central, uh, and this dots, which suggest the like, central vascular uh, papillae, or central vascular core of papillae. So these would be more papillae than um, follicles. And what's the difference again? Um, the central vascular core. Exactly. So here you see this little central vascular core sticking up. And so you see these papillae, uh, and you don't have that intense mononuclear inflammatory cell reaction. But this is still reactive. The most common time we see papillae, it would be contact, contact, contact lenses. lenses. And what do we call that? Um, I'm not sure. We call it giant papillary conjunctivitis. Another you know, pseudonym you need to know, GPC. So these are, you know, these you can see in people from contact lenses. It can be a reaction to the solutions,
could be a reaction of proteins absorbed on there, a lot of different things. And here we see why we call it that. This is giant papillary conjunctivitis, or GPC. All right, this is, you guys, I, I don't know if I can pick you guys or not, but if you want to make a stab at it. It's, a, <coughs> it's an external photograph of the eyes. You see the pulvar conjunctiva superiorly, the cornea inferiorly, and on the limbus, there's some infiltration. Yeah, so you almost cells. see like little bumps on the limbus here. What if this is a teenager? It's a teenager, and their That's eyes are right. itching intently. Vernal. Yeah, exactly. So there is a condition called vernal conjunctivitis. Vernal meaning spring, and so you'll often see these in, in younger people, adolescents, and they'll come in with intense itching, and they'll also have papillae inside their upper lids, but they can get these little bumps at the limbus, and so we call this condition limbal dermoid. And so this is a young person with limbal, uh, I'm sorry, limbal vernal. Sorry, limbal vernal. So this is a young person with limbal vernal. All right, you want to make a stab at this one? So we have the lower palpebra conjunctiva with a white appearance. Looks like a little raised appearance, I guess. Yeah, kind of raised, almost pedunculated, you know, looking piece of tissue. What would your differential there be? So it could be like large. What if you took a, I took a fan off head and shined it, and it turned out it was not um, cyst, not cystic. It was more solid. It could be more like an internal aureolum. All right. So again, think of things like you know, <coughs> aureolums, things like that. Now, in this particular case, this is what it looked like. So, what do we see in here when we look at low power? All right, so we're seeing a really loose connective tissue. Very, very loose, not a lot of fibrous tissue to it. All kinds of capillaries all over the place and all kinds of little blue dots. I don't know if I said this the very first day, but the first rule of pathology, blue is bad. Okay, so a lot of blue in there. Caleb, the heck can this be? Uh, so it's, it could be pyogenic granuloma. All right, so why so, is, it, is it weird that we have to memorize pyogenic granuloma? It's, it's a double misnomer. So you have, uh, it's not pyogenic, uh, it's not, it's not like pus producing, or it's not like pee producing, it's not granulomatous tissue. Exactly, so this is one of those double misnomers. It's called the pyogenic granuloma, and that's what's in the literature. Pyogenic literally means fever inducing. From what language? Greek. From the Greek, of course. So fever inducing. It's not fever inducing. It's not infectious. It's not a granuloma. There's no giant cells. There's no epithelial cells in here. It's an exuberant granulation tissue. And so there's a lot of budding capillaries, loose connective tissue, mixed inflammation. There are a few little PMNs in here, but there's lots of lymphocytes. There's even some plasma cells. So this mixed inflammation, it's kind of a demodus, loose connective tissue, and it's a reaction to something. So it's like a, an exuberant granulation tissue reaction to something, but it's called a pyogenic granuloma. So again, you gotta memorize a double misnomer. Boy, Vaish, what do we see in here? Um, so in this um, photo of the left eye, there's uh, extensive chemosis and um, just injection of the conjunctiva. Okay, what would your differential here be? Um, like uh, infectious cause, Okay, so we look, you know, and you look at it, this is kind of more redder than usual. I was trying to take a picture here and didn't do a good job. It's a, this is, is what they call salmon colored, kind of pink colored. So when, when salmon pops up, what do you start to think of? Lymphoma. Lymphoma. So believe it or not, you can have lymphomas of the conjunctiva. Now, you know, most commonly lymphomas occur in the orbit, but, but number two is under the conjunctiva. And so, Sure enough, as we look at the pathology, it's this sheet of lymphocytes. So when you look at a picture of a lymphoma, it looks like someone took a handful of lymphocytes and just smeared them across the slide. And so this is a lymphoma. So remember, lymphoma of the conjunctiva can occur. And if you ever hear someone say salmon patch, you know, then it because you know salmon are kind of pink on the inside. So 
you think of lymphoma. And here we see an immunoperoxidase stain. Most of these are B cell, mantle cell lymphomas. And so they're mostly B cells, not T cells. So here's an immunoperoxidase showing this is a B cell stain. All right, what are we looking at right here? gelatinous, translucent appearance, what would you be concerned about here? Um, some kind of um, neoplasia? Exactly. So some kind of a surface epithelial neoplasia of some kind, because when you see this, it's not your run-of-the-mill pterygium. You know, it's, it's more thickening of the epithelium rather than the subepithelium, which is a pterygium. So if you look right here, as the beam hits it, you see this kind of a translucent thick epithelium here as opposed to subepithelium. And here's just another view that you've got this area that's kind of at the limbus, it's this thick gelatinous thickening of the epithelium. Now we look at the pathology right here and what do we see in here at, at this low power? Um, you see there's um, some more cellular atypia as you get closer to the basement membrane and you also see the, uh, some keratin at the top. Yeah, this may even have a little bit of keratin, so this little dusky keratin that's lesion. What's the most important layer we need to look at in a, in a um, specimen like this? Uh, the basement. The basement membrane. So let's say for argument purposes that the basement membrane is completely intact. What would we call this? We call it um, CIN. CIN. And what does CIN stand for? Uh, conjunctival. Exactly. Now, and it, it's even the same category that there's actually cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, but we're not doing cone biopsies here. So, but it's the same idea. It's a mucous membrane that starts to go rogue, and when it does, you can get it replacing the epithelium itself. But the key is the difference between CIN and frank squamous cell carcinoma is that the basic membrane is still intact. All right, Becca. When we look at CIN, we subdivide it into three different areas pathologically. What do we, how do we subdivide it? Oh, so, uh, I think it's based on the um, amount of atopia that you see and also the, the depth. All right, more specific. Uh, so, uh, mild atopia is the first um, category. Okay, and what, what is that, what, what part of the epithelium is involved when it's mild? So I know it's really hard, so, so it's like everybody knows the answer, and then as soon as the spotlight hits them, as, as Winston Churchill said, an iron curtain descends you know, across your cerebral cortex, when the spotlight hits, it goes chink, and you go, what's your name? The first, the third. Uh, oh, baby. Okay. Exactly, so it's the lower third. So when you remember, epithelium grows from the basement membrane up, and so when it's mild CIN, it's the, it's the lower third. Moderate is up to two-thirds, marked is full thickness. So that's how we grade them. And, and it's important because the more um, of the atypia you have, the more chance you have of it going on into squamous cell carcinoma. And so you look here at this one. Here's the basic membrane. And look at all these nucleoli in here and pleomorphism. And so how would you categorize this one? So this looks like it's extending at least two-thirds, maybe yeah. even full thickness. So this would be... Marked or severe, yep. So mild, moderate, marked or severe for CIN. And here you can see again, this definitely goes full thickness. Look at that, here's a huge cell, multiple nucleoli, very active looking. So CIN with marked dysplasia. Let's go back here. Kara, what do we see in here? So this is like a um, leukoplakic What does leukoplakia mean? White. White plaque, basically. Because you know, remember leukocytes, white blood cells, so white plaque. And so this has probably got some keratin in it. So again, our differential here would be the um, CIN versus 
versus squamous. So these lesions do tend to arise from the limbus initially, both CIN and squamous cell. And so if we look right here, how is this different from the previous one? So it looks like in this photo, the basement membrane is disrupted and the abnormal cells are breaking. Exactly, so here's some abnormal cells sneaking through the basement membrane. So, you know, the, the brave Texans are sitting in the Alamo and they're sitting behind the basement membrane wall and then, oops, you know, a few thousand soldiers come over the wall and breach the basement membrane and then you're toast. So basically, once those epithelial cells breach that basement membrane, it becomes a superficially invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Stop that. Yawning is contagious. When she starts, here, yeah, Catherine did it earlier, and once someone yawns, everybody does it. Stop that. All right, so you can see right here in this one, these cells have gone well beyond the basement membrane. And in fact, what is this stuff right here? Um, is that a keratin pearl? It's a keratin pearl. And so these can actually make keratin, even though you know normal conjunctiva doesn't make keratin when they're stimulated, you know, whatever it is that makes them dysplastic. You can actually see, here's the dysplastic cells, and they're past the basement membrane, and the substantial propria, and you can even see keratin whorls and keratin pearls. And so these could be pretty nasty. This is an exenteration, and here you can see this is actually going into the sclera. And so you see this squamous cell carcinoma actually growing down through and even under the sclera. And so if you can remove these before they spread, you can cure them surgically, but once they start, the spread, they can go into the orbit, they can go in, in, into the sclera. They usually don't eat through the sclera and go into the eye, but they can certainly spread throughout the orbit. And, okay, I, I pimped you enough, Rachel. So, if, if these tumors spread, where do they go? Or how do they get out of the eye sometimes or the orbit sometimes? I, what the heck is this? It's, structure here with some funny tumor cells involving it. Almost, not quite. It's a nerve. And so Boopy will often stress this. When you've got squamous cell carcinomas, oftentimes they can spread along the nerves, if not even inside the nerves, and go, you know, through the orbit, even back to the brain. And so one of the things that he'll really stress when you're concerned about these squamous cell spreading is, the, is look for hyposthesias. And so especially if they're going inferiorly and going along, you'll look for you know, some inferior, infraorbital hypos, hyposthesia and some areas where these tumor cells have gone along the nerve because that's how they spread back. So about once every other year, we'll show one of these at Orbit Conference and the um, anesthesiologist will show how it's spread along the nerves to get back out of the eye. So remember these squamous cells, they can go to the, the ones from the lids will often go to the nodes but the ones from the, um, that spread from the conjunctiva can often go along the nerves and then spread. There you can see again, here's a nerve, and here's these tumor cells right going along the side of that nerve to spread. Tina, what are we seeing here? So this is a good picture. The reason I show this is, look at, here's pigment here, superficial along the limbus. What is that right there? pigment here, but look at the, the change in the color. This is that brown pigment on the surface. Where is this located? That is completely to the Exactly. So this is deeper to the sclera. So the reason I like this picture kind of shows the difference between superficial pigment and then deeper, deep to the scleral pigment. So when you see someone like this with this deep pigment, maybe even underneath the sclera, what do you think about? Eventually you would, but this is, is still really early on. 
Where would you want to look elsewhere in this patient if you see this deeper pigment here? You'd want to look elsewhere around the eye. And so this is actually an oculocutaneous melanosis. And so it's not yet melanoma. It could become melanoma, but the difference is it's not surface melanocytes, it's deep melanocytes in the choroid or underneath the sclera. And these people can also have melanosis on the skin and the eyelid and even on that half of the face. So people can get, it's called oculocutaneous melanosis. You can also get what's called a nevus of oda. And so this is melanosis rather than melanoma, and it's a deep pigmentation. All right, uh, Chris, what are we looking at right here? Here we're seeing um, uh, this kind of, it looks a little raised and maybe a little pigmented to me, almost a like yellowish brownish lesion on the conch right there. Um, just probably medial to the limbus right there. All right, so what would you be concerned about here? Um, so I mean, pigmented lesions, we think about, you know, could this be just a nevus, could this be, Pam, could this be you know, worst case melanoma? Um, All right, so if you look, you don't see that superficial, you know, dusting that you normally see with, with Pam. And so this is more uh, just kind of a diffuse, lighter brown color there. Sometimes these can even look red. And so this is a nevus. And the classic story, usually you'll see these, these will be adolescent age. And so oftentimes you'll, you'll question mom, and mom will say, yeah, it's been there for a few years, but it's getting bigger. And so oftentimes these can even be congenital in nature, but they'll look kind of pink. They won't be that elevated, but as the kids hit, hit the beginning of adolescence and, and finally into puberty, melanocytes really grow. And so these things will grow when kids start to hit their growth spurt, which gets younger and younger every year now. And so my theory is it's, it's all the hormones they give the you know, cattle that they grow. So when we eat those McDonald's burgers, we get hormones. And so, but it's probably nutritional. And so people are hitting uh, puberty much earlier now than 100 years ago. I mean, we're talking like two years earlier. So these kids hit puberty, they hit late adolescence, these start to grow, they become noticeable. Noticeable to mom, noticeable to the, to the teenager. And so we can remove these. And when you remove them, um, this is what we see on this particular lesion. What the heck are these cystic areas? Show you a close up. So there's melanocytes here, and then scattered throughout are these little cystic structures. Um, what kind of cells are these? They look like goblet cells, exactly. So these are actually epithelial line cysts. So when you remove a nevus, you know, a nevus, and you see epithelial line cyst, that's a good thing. And that means this has been there for a long time, maybe even congenital or certainly since the, the child was very, very young. And so the way I remember these is, which embryologic layer do melanocytes come from? Uh, neurocrest. neurocrest. So the melanocytes come from the neurocrest. They migrate out to the junction you know, between the epithelium and the substantial propria, they start to grow. Eventually, they drop off into the subepithelial tissue. And while they're doing that, they grab epithelium and pull it with them. Okay, now don't say that on boards. That's not, but that's how you remember it, okay? So remember this. Just don't, when they ask you on boards, how does that happen? Well, it grabs epithelium and pulls them down. So don't do that on oral boards. But that's a way to remember it. So when you see these epithelial line cysts, with these benign neva cells, this tells you this has been here for a long time, maybe even congenital. All right, so when we, I guess, do, when we subdivide, so Shrav, when we subdivide these, you know, nevi, there's a lot of it depends on where they're located. So what kind of a nevus would this be? So I see some melanocytes in the epidermal and then subdermal area. So it's nevus. Well, this would be definitely at least a junctional nevus. Now, if you look down here, a lot of these cells are actually plasma cells, lymphocytes, and even macrophages chewing up a little bit of pigment. So technically, this one is still right there at that area. So this is called a junctional nevus. 
And then as those cells drop down, you can get more of a compound nevus. So you get melanocytes both at the junction and subepithelially. And then lastly, when you completely lose your connection with the junction, this is the equivalent of a dermal nevus in the skin. Obviously, there's no dermis in the con, so we call this a subepithelial nevus. So you can have junctional, you can have junctional and subepithelial, what's called compound, and then you can have just subepithelial nevi. The reason that's important is once nevi lose their connection to the junction, they lose their malignant potential. So when you have a junctional or compound nevus, still that could become a melanoma. When you have a strictly subepithelial nevus, there's no malignant potential. All right, Brad, what are we seeing right here? So this is an external photograph. Um, we see around the lumbar region, there's an area of pigmentation. Um, and so um, differential at this time would be, you know, like a, a nevus or primary acquired melanosis or worst case scenario, a melanoma. Okay, so when you look at it though, you don't see thickening, you just kind of see superficial dusting, and so this would most likely be a... PAM. A PAM, and what does PAM stand for? Primary acquired melanosis. Melanosis, exactly. So every year I tell this story, but it's a great story. So this lady comes in, you know, on the um, you know, <coughs> psychiatric rating system, on an anxiety scale of, of you know, one to four, she's a 10. And so she has this lesion on here. She's convinced she's going to die of cancer. She went to the internet. She's convinced she's going to die of melanoma. I told her, don't worry about it. This is, you know, just superficial. It's not a tumor. We're going to take pictures of it. Come back in six months. If it ever grows, we'll take it off. But if you notice any change, give me a call. So that evening, I'm sitting at home. The resident on call calls me, said, did you see Mrs. So-and-so today? Yes, I did. Well, she's calling me now. It's growing. <laughs> <laughs> and so we removed it, which is good because we often don't remove, you know, with, with atyp you know, lesions that don't have any atypia, and sure enough, we got this pathology. And so what do we see in here? So we can see that this is um, stratified squamous epithelium, non-keratinized, so coming from the conge and along the basal layer there, there looks like to be pigmented cells, which would correlate to melanocytes. Exactly. So in PAM, we subdivide it into PAM without atypia and PAM with atypia. So this is PAM without atypia. It's pigmented melanocytes right along the base of the layer, no atypia, no spread through the epithelium, no atypical features. And this is what racial pigment looks like. And so, you know, if you see someone who's darker skin and they've got this little pigment around the limbus, that's what this looks like also. So benign melanocytes along the basilar layer. Here they are, totally benign, PAM without atypia. What are we seeing right here? Um, so we see a small photograph um, of the right eye showing um, hyperpigmentation, uh, temporal to limbus, and there seems to be disruption of the limbus and surrounding tissue. So you'd be more concerned about this one, because this isn't just superficial dusting. So we, we take off this tissue, and sure enough, what do we see in here? Um, so we see the, the hyperpigmented um, like melanocytes, but they seem to be all over. This, the, there is a big basement membrane there, but they're... Believe it or not, this is it. still not beyond the basement membrane. Uh, so this is now PAM with atypia. So when you start to see the melanocytes invading up into the epithelium and showing dysplastic features, it now becomes PAM with atypia. The reason that this is important is PAM with atypia can be a precursor to malignant melanoma. So if you take 100 malignant melanomas of the conge, 80% of them will have pre-existing PAM with atypia. Now it's not the flip side. It's not 80% of PAM with atypia goes to melanoma. It's not, but if you have malignant melanoma, about 80% of them will arise from pre-existing PAM. And so this is something you've got to watch really carefully. It'll pop up in different places. What's interesting about this picture right here is, if you look, there's some scarring here. This patient has had previous removal of lesions, and he would just keep popping them up. And so you would take them off, and then a year later you'd come back, there'd be different ones in different places, and they start looking like this. And so your concern is when you get PAM with atypia, you know, sometimes you can see this. Look at all the scarring and the symblepharon. But you see pigment here and here, but look, pigment in the fornix. And so 
One thing you got to take away today, pigmented lesions in the fornix is melanoma until proven otherwise. So if you see pigment down here in the fornix, you don't say, well, it could be Pam. Yeah, it could be, but you can't just take that for granted. You got to remove it. So pigmented, you know, in the fornix there is, is melanoma unless proven otherwise. And as we look right here, I know it's a low power, I'll go to a higher power. Here is epithelium. Here are the melanocytes. In the epithelium, in the epithelium, oops, breaking through the basic membrane into the subepithelial tissue. So this has now gone from PAM with atypia to malignant melanoma. And here you can see, look at these bizarre cells, these big cells. Big nucleoli, lots of clump chromatin, bizarre looking cells. So malignant melanoma arising from pre-existing PAM. And then you can do special stains if you're not sure. Reporting differentiated tumors are hard to tell, but this is an immunoperoxidase stain, and this is a stain called HMB45, which stains for melanocytes. It doesn't tell you whether they're benign or malignant, but it tells you they're melanocytes. So you can always do special stains if you don't know for sure. And this is what happens if you don't take care of these. And so these can invade locally, they can invade into the orbit, they can metastasize, they can be very nasty, so don't let them get to this point. This is Mozart. All right, so see, I do put people in here. <laughs> There's some people in there. I just don't want to make you guys look at pictures of me. And so, all right, now, I left, I left like a couple of minutes here for questions. Um, questions on any conch lesions, including uh, malignant lesions. So if you see a new patient um, and they have like PMNs, would you generally take photos of them? To, to track that, or are you like, do you see like they look normal so you don't bother? Yeah, no, I'll take pictures because you know, a picture is, is very good to document something. I mean, you know, if you're really compulsive, you would draw something and you could draw it in there and you can measure it and all that. And I do measure pigmented lesions, but it's always a good idea to take a picture because then when they come back again in six months, you can compare the person directly to the picture. So I'll often photograph them, any of the pigmented lesions that are suspicious. Other questions? Yes? I have a, like a lid or skin question. How is um, a nevus different from like a freckle? Like, how would we distinguish that in pathology? Is there a difference? Freckle is, is a bad term because freckles are just, just variations of nevi. Right. A, fe a felis or something? Is there What's a that? So E-P-H-E-L-I-S, or there's like a more technical term for it that comes up on questions of, um, like on off the question. That's a term I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm not, not aware of that term. So what's it again? Um, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Email it to me and I'll, I'll see okay. what, it, what it corresponds to. Yes? So in terms of pyogenic granulomas, um, I, I, I find that the hardest one to see on pathology in terms of identifying it. So what are some like characteristic features of it that we should look for? Hang on, we'll get to it. So one of the key things when you look at low power is it's a very loose connective tissue. It's almost edematous. So when you look right here, you see it looks white. So instead of being fibrotic, instead of being pink, instead of having collagen all over the place, it looks white. It's got edema. It's got fluid all over it. And it's got all of these little capillary spaces in it. So these little blood vessels. If you look carefully, there's blood vessels everywhere. And most lesions are not that vascularized, even a papilloma is not that vascularized. And so when you look right here, you see that it's very, very vascularized. It's got loose connective tissue. And then when we look at higher power, it's the cell type. It's a mixture. It's not only lymphocytes and plasma cells, but it's also PMNs and even eosinophils sometimes. And so loose, loose connective tissue edematous, lots of budding capillaries, and a mixed inflammatory cell reaction. PMNs, um, eosinophils, lymphocytes, plasma cells. But it's not, I mean, it's not an infection, right? No, it's actually a granulation. It's an exuberant healing response. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess, I'm, why, like, why do you have neutrophils in there? Because I, when I think of neutrophils, I think of like an acute inflammatory. Well, sometimes this can be due to like a foreign body irritation. Sometimes this can be due to an old suture fragment and just anything that triggers it will do that. And so whenever you get an exuberant healing response. PMNs are part of the healing response. 
So it's like a healing response run amok. It's kind of like a keloid, only of the conjunctiva. But I hate it because it's a double misnomer, so you've got to memorize that, you know, it's not pyogenic, it's not a granuloma. It's granulation. Other questions? Yes? Oh, you, you, you don't. They look the same. It can be either one. They really look the same. It's, it's those little melanocytes along the basilar layer. And so we'll often see that in people who are darkly pigmented. You'll see around the limbus this brown pigment all the way around. And if you were to take the pathology of that, it would look exactly the same oh. as PAM without atypia. Oh, that's not PAM? Well, it's not necessarily PAM. We, I call it racial pigmentation. But it, pathologically, it's PAM. But, but it's, it's racial pigmentation. PAM you usually see in lighter pigmented people. But it's exactly the same pathology. It's benign melanocytes just along the basilar layer. So racial pigmentation looks just like PAM if you were to take PATH. So what would prompt you to biopsy something like that? If it grows, if it's thick, if it's irregular. And so when you look at this, a PAM is just strictly flat, Almost like somebody just dusted the conge with pigment. Because I could say like that, a lot of the PAM lesions I've seen, they kind of look irregular, but like I guess they're irregular elevations. Well, PAM with atypia definitely can look irregular. So we're, we're talking about PAM without atypia. That's where you see right here. It's just that little surface dusting. It's almost like, you know, the, the, the good fairy came and sprinkled, you know, melanocyte dust on there. And so you can see right here, it's flat, it's not elevated, it's just that little area of dusting right there. Whereas PAM without atip PAM with atypia is often thickened, it's irregular. You know, you can see right here, it's irregular, it's thickened, it's got fingers going out, it's multicentric. That is what you really worry about. So that's when you worry about that it's either PAM with atypia or maybe even going toward melanoma. So you've got to <coughs> continue to remove these. This was a guy at the VA we saw a few years ago. And, I mean, literally, he had a couple of different times these would pop up. You'd take them off, he'd be fine, and then you'd come back, you know, six months, a year later, and then boom, you'd have more lesions popping up elsewhere. So something is disordered with his melanocytes, or maybe he had chronic sun exposure or whatever that, that triggers these. Uh, regarding those lesions, have you heard of a new classification system, C-min or conjunctival, melanocytic, intraepithelial and neoplasm? Is it just a different way of differentiating? You know, it's, it's, we're not good enough with just classifying something so you can memorize it and remember it forever. <laughs> and so about every 10 years, you have to sit down and reclassify it so you have to learn a whole new thing. In my career, the lymphomas, the lymphocytic lesions, have now been reclassified three different times, and so you have to like drop everything you know and reclassify it. Um, surface neoplasia of the eyes, you know, including skin and conjunctiva with the squamous cell neoplasm, those have all been changed, and you know, all this stuff where I used to talk about, you know, is it um, carcinoma in situ? Is it a you know, just within the epithelium and beyond. Now they all lump it together into this ocular surface neoplasia. So for boards, you guys have to remember that. Um, I'm grandfathered. I don't have to take boards anymore, and, and I don't have to waste neuronal space learning new nomenclature for the same thing. But for you guys, you do. So when you look at that, make sure. Because, you know, we've got all this nice thing about CIN and all that. Now it's all lumped under, under the, the category of, of ocular surface neoplasia. But it's all part of CIN going to squamous cell. I think it's easier to understand if you think it of in terms of CIN and the three levels and then microinvasive and then invasive. But again, we have to reclassify everything about every 10 years. And so once you guys know them all and you pass boards and you're in practice, 10 years later, you're going to be reading a journal and go, what? So don't worry, it'll happen like three times in your career, they'll reclassify everything, you have to re-memorize everything. Can, can the, uh, for, for racial pigment, can that eventually change into PMM with atypia? It can, but very uncommon. Usually it does not. 
And so, you know, melanocytic lesions, just like melanomas of the skin and elsewhere, are very uncommon in, in pigmented people. More common in people who are just really white, you know, white, white people. Other questions? All right, very good. Have a great Christmas. Thank you for the uh, real yesterday. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah.